This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest once again is Tony Alvarez. Tony is a well-heeled, seasoned, knowledgeable, and successful real estate investor, licensed broker, developer, and certified general appraiser. He worked in real estate since 1981. Tony has built, purchased, rehabbed, rented, and sold hundreds of properties from vacant land to condos, single-family residences, apartments, and commercial properties, and is well-versed in the risks and requirements for success inherent in different types of real estate investments. Tony is also a sought-after speaker and has previously spoken at the Norris Group's Multimillionaire Maker in 2005 and 2006, as well as many other real estate investment clubs and events throughout Southern California and Nevada. Tony, welcome back. It's wonderful to see you, Bruce. It's wonderful to be with you. Man, I was getting tired just while you were reading all that stuff. I'm thinking, man, have I really yeah. done all that stuff? It's just not real. <laughs> I like the well-heeled part. That was your <laughs> word, not mine. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know where that came from, but I remember at some point, I think I had something to do with that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's why I, I emphasized it. I just thought, well, there you go. I haven't heard that well-heeled. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a modest uh, statement that's cool yeah, yes. um i kind of want to go back to because i you know one of the reasons you and i have connected i think is we've we approach human beings in honor in a way in other words i, I know that we're going to talk some of the stories but you, you and i probably don't meet if you didn't see something in me the first time that you saw me and that that Absolutely. was it yeah, and that was interesting because if you think about what what sequences would not have happened to both of our lives, wow. that's a ma- that's a major thing. It's it's beyond major. Now you put it that way, yeah. You just you just made my brain go like a roll a reel of video just went back in time. Yeah, it's actually you you know without without any flattering or anything in this statement, you impacted my life in ways that I cannot even begin to explain. And, and, I, and I appreciate that. And, you know, and you in turn have done that many times to, to groups. So that's what's interesting from a, from a seed that the odds of you, first of all, being in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Your response to a question that was asked by somebody else and then, <laughs> and then my response to it set yeah. all of this stuff off. So, so I, I happened to be speaking at an apartment owners association and you were in the audience. Yeah. yeah. And after, after I get done, somebody, uh, you know, we're doing some Q and a, and I think somebody asked me something about commercial property. Well, yeah. And it, it was, it was, um, it was interesting because I actually went there. I, I, I had heard about you and um, I was concerned about me not knowing enough about market timing and stuff like that, because I had gotten hurt in the real estate market before I made a lot of money. And then I, I actually ended up uh, going through bankruptcy and stuff like that. So, um, and it was pretty tough for me because I, I found myself in a position repeating what had been work, what, 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 what had worked for me. And I just kept doing more of it, of course, as the market has changed and now I'm digging a hole instead of uh, doing anything else. So I had heard about you. And then I, I found out you were speaking at the Apartment Owners Association, which, as you know, it's not really riddled with single family guys. You know, these no, are no. no, these are apartment guys and, uh, and uh, pretty, pretty sophisticated, you know. And, and, and so I went there and I never forget it because I went there with a friend of mine who was uh, who was an Argentine guy who wasn't really into real estate. He didn't understand why I'm, I'm you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go see some guy talk about real estate. And and I'm in the audience and it was a pretty good it was a pretty good sized group. And you were going on and on about the stuff with the market changes and you know, all this stuff. And then this out of nowhere in this huge, and I, I never forget it. This guy in the kind of like in the middle of the room, I see his <laughs> hand going up and, and uh, you, you stopped in, in the middle of your thing. You said, yes. And he goes, I, I just have a question. He says, he, he stood up and he goes, you know, you've been talking about real estate market and stuff and, and market changes, but, and you're kind of a single family guy he says we're, we're all apartment owners out here. And how's that going to affect us? And, and honestly, 
I, I, everybody resonated with that question. And, and, I, and I just looked at you and I thought, oh my God, uh, what's this guy going to do, you know? And I watched you for a second. You hesitated for a minute. You kind of were thinking to yourself and you, and you did something that I never will ever forget because for as long as I've known you, I always know that after you do this little shift that you, that you did, a physical shift of your body, and you kind of giggled to yourself a little, you kind of laughed a little bit to yourself, what's going to come out of you is going to be pretty important. So I always get ready to listen, right? So you do this little shifting and you say, you know, I really don't know. Can I continue with this, <laughs> with this presentation? And there was, a, there was a little bit of laughter, you know, uh, in, in the room. But we all, I think, realized in that moment that Bruce Norris was a guy who was not going to BS us. I mean, because I realized as you did that, I, in my mind, I thought I was racing. My mind was racing when that guy asked a question. And in all honesty, I, I kind of put myself in your shoes and I was thinking, what would I say? I would say, yeah, probably the same thing. And then go on to the next point. Or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to shift, to pivot off of that uncomfortable moment, you know. Well, you, you, you know, one of the things that was, it's nice, it's not uncomfortable because I don't, I got taught not to loop. Uh, looping yes. is when you, when you pretend you know something that you don't. I yes. learned this. I'm going to tell the story because it's also important because people need to understand smart people set you up to see if you'll tell the truth in uncomfortable situations because they eliminate you the second they can't trust you. Right. There was, there was a woman that was in she was Jewish and she was in a concentration camp when she was like four years old and, and she survived oh, wow. it. She was the mayor of Corona and she owned an electric company. And I, I just happened to walk through the door and ask if I could quote their work. And she reaches down and brings up a, a set of plans for a school that's like a foot wide and had to weigh 30, 40 pounds. She, she plops it on the desk. And she rolls it to me. She said, I'd like you to do a switch gear takeoff for me. I said, Mrs. Spiegel, I said, if I looked at, at it all year, I would not be able to do that. That is not what I know. She said, I'm so glad you said that, young man. I can work with you. And she yeah. went, took me downstairs and ordered $5,000 in circuit breakers. And we did business for years. Had I looped? Had I told her wrong? So that's why it's not uncomfortable, because it became more comfortable just to tell the truth. And I think I said something like, that's not my, that's not my expertise. And I was being honest and it was the easiest thing partly. And this is important, Tony, because that decision was made years ago. It yeah. wasn't made on the spot. That, and and so, that's true. I, I, I do understand that. Yes, I do. So, but that, it, that prompted you to come to the front. You, you and yes. I talked after that. Well, yeah, because I, I, as I was saying, when that happened, um, I, I think I wasn't the only one feeling the stress of that moment. Okay. I think everyone in that room kind of was hanging on what, it, okay, what's this guy going to say? And, and the way you responded, it was very, it was just a very honest uh, retort that, that you gave in it. And, and we all felt, we all felt in that moment, I think that we all knew Bruce Norris. I mean, it, that, and then, and that's what I, I didn't know you up until that moment, but when you did that, boom, I thought, okay, I'm going to meet this guy because I know no matter <laughs> what I ask this guy, he's going to tell me this, uh, uh, the truth, whether I want to hear it or not. He's going, to, he's going to find a way to let me know exactly what he sees. So that was extremely valuable. And, you know, you only have to be in business for a short time, never mind your own personal life as you're growing up, uh, to realize that, you know, when somebody's willing to tell you the way it is, regardless of the consequences, that's somebody who you want to have as a friend. So, so I did. I went up to the stage and I was there and I never forget it because I was the only one waiting behind that little thing there. Well, I wanted to be the first one in line, you know, to, uh, to get to you. And, um, and sure enough, I wanted to meet you and, and, uh, and, and I, want, I wanted to become friends with you, which, by the way, is something that happened very naturally um, because I never I don't recall ever not sitting down with you and discussing, of course, I'm discussing my stuff and I had my questions about this or that, that I didn't feel that I didn't have your 100% of your attention and your interest in whatever was going on with me. So, and that, and that, and that you know, you can, I, I, you can see, you know, when you're dealing with someone, if they're talking to you because they got, like, I was at a meeting last night, okay, I was at a, 
at an apartment, uh, not an apartment owner, uh, uh, at a real estate club meeting up here. And the attorney who was speaking, a very nice guy, but but his his he he couldn't wait to get out of that room. Okay, that's all I can tell you. He, you can sense that the guy, you know, he's like, okay, okay, uh -huh, yep, yep, get that guy. You got another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it? What is it? He was in a real hurry to kind of get the hell out of there, you know. Right. But, um, yeah. So, 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 yeah, that started a friendship with you, um, both on a personal level and on a business level. That that has been probably you 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 represent one of the greatest relationships in my life, really. Uh, because you had such an impact, I can honestly tell you that if it wasn't for our meeting and for the the genuine interest that you took every time we sat to speak about anything, that I would have probably made some pretty dumb decisions. You know, um, I really appreciate that. Well, yeah. what you showed me, you know, that that day was, you know, a, a portfolio of rentals that was really <laughs> impressive. That, and I think that what what was the year? Oh three. Was that 03 or 04? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, all three. Yeah, oh yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were you were basically on the verge of selling everything to accomplish, you know, some some goals that you had set and that yeah. would, and that in fact would accomplish it. And, yeah. and I was, I happened to have 93 lots. So it's funny, you had the urgency and you had a finished product <laughs> and I had no urgency dragging my feet to build 93 houses because it wasn't time yet. <laughs> right. And, and, and I was riddled with fear at the time, because when you come through, you know, when you work really hard and, and I had worked really, really, really hard and, and paid the price for it. I started, you know, nothing. And I and I uh, and, and then you take a hit, you know, and you end up losing your stuff and you end up making pizzas at Shakey's Pizza or something, with, you know, with the, I can all I remember was a little orange tie and the orange hat that made me look like Porky Pig, you know, and, and, work, and, and walking home. Yeah, and, and what walking home and walking to work. I didn't even have a car at that at, at, at that time. So, you know, to get back into the to get whatever it is to get back into the business, whatever it took. And I, I was down and out for about a year. Um, and then and then you know put your heart into that, and then do everything that's involved in getting in, you know and in, in, in getting back up again. Um, you live to a certain extent. I mean, and it's a large part of what of what stays with you is the fear that I could be there again. Yeah. You know, I, uh, what, what's it and at any moment uh, I could be seeing something and I'm not seeing it clearly, or I'm not seeing all the components behind all of these factors that are forever changing uh, in the marketplace. It's not just about, you know, the buy low, sell high, um, when, where, what's coming. <laughs> you know, is that well, one of the, one of the things that you had said to me, and I don't know if you said it in that meeting, but certainly later I heard that, you know, you basically set a goal to have 10 free and clear properties. Right, right, so right. in other words, you just wanted to lock in safety for your financial future. And yeah. you, at that point you had done that. If you had, if you had this chance to sell what you wanted to sell, that was a done deal. You had already accomplished your goal if you wanted to do it. I had accomplished my goal way before that meeting with you. And the way that it happened was that the initial part was working. I did it one house at a time kind of thing. And, and, and honestly, I got, I blew past my goal without even realizing I had done it only because I got so good at, at uh, quite frankly, working, building relationships with people that could help me. Um, and, and I, but I, but I built those relationships based on my performance because they knew, you know, like yourself, to be very frank, I was unwilling, you know, after I came out of bankruptcy and went through and had that experience, I had a time where I sat with myself and decided, okay, if I'm going to do this again, I'm going to change some things. And, and, and part of that, to be very frank with you, part of that decision-making occurred on my walk home from the LA courthouse. I had to walk all the way to Burbank because they took my car in court. That the, the guy, the poor guy had been chasing me around to repossess my car for I don't know how many months. And the judge said, Mr. Alvarez, I'll take your keys, please. Because the guy in the back over there has been looking for you for six months. And <laughs> oh, of course, no. yeah, it was totally. And I said, Your Honor, how am I going to get home? And he honestly, that, one of those moments, you know, he says, Mr. Alvarez, I don't care if you walk home. <laughs> Which was exactly what I was going to have to do. But all of those things culminate in, in, in developing, you know, how am I going to do this now? And I remember on the way home, I'm going to, I'm not, there's a lot of things I'm not going to do the same. 
And there's a few things that I'm going to do. And one of them was, I'm not going to, I'm not lying to anybody about anything. I'm not going to pretend about anything. I'm not going to, I, I have to catch myself because when you're new, when you're young and you start out, you know, and you're doing well, uh, some of those things go to your head, you know, and you, you think it's all about you. You think you're the guy making it all happen and then blah, 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 and all that happy nonsense. You know? <laughs> and then when the rug gets pulled out from under you, you realize, Man, that, it was luck. I was <laughs> I was riding on a cloud of luck here, working hard. But I think I don't know. I remember you said something some one, one time that you said in an appreciating market, even a monkey could get wealthy or something like that. You know, I, I forget it was something like that. And I remember thinking that is so accurate. You know, because all of us think we're geniuses. You know, but I uh, I got past that ten house mark without realizing I did it. And I was way beyond it. And then one night I had a dream and that's how it all started. I had a dream. I was because I carried the fear in me um, of losing it. And I had a dream that there was, listen to this, I like, guess to show you my imagination. There was an earthquake because I was in the Antelope Valley and you know, the right. sand all runs right through it. So in my dream, there was an earthquake. My houses all fell down, killed my tenants, and I was getting sued by everybody. I woke up in the middle of the night, Bruce. My heart was beating in my chest. Oh, my God. And, yeah, and I was totally panicked. And all I thought of is liquidate. Get, get, just sell everything. Just, get, just, just, just do it now because what if this happens? What if something takes place? And then that's when I, had the, I went seeking advice, and, I, and, 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 and we met, thank God, because had I not met you. You see how all this, I mean, had I not met you? I would have, I would have head for the door as soon as possible, paid the taxes or whatever I could. And I didn't want to do that, but I had a conversation with you after that. And I went to see you also at your office. Um, and you sat with me, you looked at my stuff and you came back and I thought you were going to confirm my fears. I thought you were going to say, get out now. And you said, and I'll never forget it. It was, I, I, I counted it. I went home afterwards and I counted it, and there was 10 words that, that you said to me. And you said something to the effect of, I don't think your area is done yet, you know, and, and I was for a second, I was in shock, but I had such at that moment in time, in our relationship, I had such a great respect for your knowledge and for, for the way you saw things. And then you went on to tell me about those lots that, that you bought. I was in Palmdale, Lancaster, and you were in Rosamond which I consider to be even a worse area. It, it, yeah. And it is, it is a worse area. <laughs> you know, that's what's funny, you know, in the areas that you bought in Rosamond, how many, how many years out of 20 years do you have a shot at making a big pile of money in Rosamond? Like two. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it didn't even pencil. I was dragging my feet in 2003 because it wouldn't pencil. Yeah. And in 2005, when we sold them all, it penciled great. And literally, we get done with the houses. The time frame was so tight that something started to happen to the market. And we had two escrows fall out at 280. And all of a sudden, no one shows up at any open house. Now, three months later, people were like literally showing up and fighting to get a reservation on a house that wasn't complete yet. Now we have nobody coming. So we auction off what was a 280 house for 205. And a few years later, oh. I think you bought one for under 40. So yeah, I was buying, yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> I was buying, and I was so happy. I was out there because I remember I, it, people have to understand folks that are not familiar with this, with this area. I mean, I mean, you don't even get to, this doesn't even come up on your GPS. Okay. You can drive through that place and blink and you're right through Rosemont. You, you don't even know you passed it. I, I think there's one off ramp. One, one exit. Yeah, that's right. One, one exit. exit. And how many exits are after Rosamond? None for 40 miles or something. <laughs> you get to Mojave. Yeah, but, it's the end of civilization, basically. Yes, yes. But but I yeah, I, we ended up buying. I think we ended up, we bought, I think, um, after, well, after 2000 and 2008, 2009, or whatever the heck it was, we right. ended up buying some in the in the 40s. And then and we even bought some in the, a couple in the 30s. But, but we bought quite a few in there. And, but, but you were right. The window that you had to liquidate in that market is it to really benefit yeah. was a, was a blink of an eye. I mean, it, it was, was as far as all that time. So you can see, you know, that's why timing and charts and understanding yep. how that mechanism works was really vital for that project because two years later, 
that wouldn't work for a long time again. You know, if yeah. you had if you had land in Rosamond yeah, right now, it would work. Uh, yeah. You know, probably two years ago, it might not have worked. So that was your that's your window. Only crazy times work in those areas. So so you decided to keep the pile of homes that you had. I remember yeah. getting this phone call. So so and you had a lot of homes, and so you asked yeah. me, well. What month is the best month for me to sell houses? Like, no, well, that, you can't. Shows, that only shows you the level of respect I had in your knowledge, okay? Because I thought you should know the answer to that question. <laughs> I thought it showed that you want to sell every house at the peak at the month. <laughs> I, I think you well, have yeah. too much. You'll be your own worst enemy. You'll have too many yeah. houses. <laughs> anyway. No, no, it, 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 it all, it all, um, and that was those were those were that was a heck of a ride, really. I mean, and and uh, going going through all of that stuff um, was oh my goodness, yeah. Th th there you go. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't you, if you're the gateway to progress, shouldn't you paint your sign like once every twenty years? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like somebody drives by and shoots at it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny sign. Thanks, yeah. Joey. It, it was, uh, it was, it was, um, it was a great time. It, it, it really was a great time. And, and my business at that point in time was pretty much on autopilot. I mean, I was very involved every single day up at five o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I was at the job site by six thirty, seven 7 o'clock. I visited every rehab job site. I mean, I was really involved in everything. Um, so, so I really enjoyed the heck out of it, but yeah, I was, I would, I would say that my mindset at the time was desperation to liquidate so that I didn't get hurt. I didn't get caught at that point in the marketplace where nobody wants to, wants to buy your stuff. And you said it, that's why your words were so impactful. When I, I, I you, we had a conversation and you said, and, and I can't remember now, I think it was that you called me and you said, I think the conversation went, was very brief. You said, dump it all now. And I, of course, this is three years later, okay? Three years later after our first initial meeting. And, uh, and I, of course, I'm up $3 million. And all I did was hold on to this stuff. I didn't have to do another deal. It just all appreciated, you know, it's all, it was all in place or whatever the heck you want to call it. But it was, it was pandemonium. People were, as a matter of fact, I sold houses. And I remember this because I remember feeling the pain of thinking I was selling too early. And, and uh, I sold houses that people went on to resell and make like 30, 40 grand. I mean, these are the houses I was selling at 300,000 that I paid 30 grand for. And I'm licking my wounds over not picking up another 30, another 30,000 bucks. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't get a call with a multiple. 30 <laughs> grand times 51. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so I said, my response to you when you said dump it, I said, uh, well, well, wait a second. Um, we're, we're up quite a bit, and the market still is still soaring. Uh, Bruce, are you sure about this? You know, so and you, and you said, okay. I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you. Answer this question: Would you rather sell your stuff to a euphoric market when everybody wants it, or do you want to try selling it when no one's going to want your stuff? And you brought me back to when I had actually experienced that in my past. And I said, the, my only response to you was, okay, thank you. <laughs> I mean, you, you brought, with, with that question, you brought me right back to reality. My greed got kicked out the door. And I'm not gonna tell you that it, that it, that it, that it was easy because I would have, you know, I would hear about, and never forget, I ran into a woman at a grocery store that she was checking out and her daughter and they had bought a house from me and that she was reselling it. She, she thought, her, you know, she's an investor now. She's going to resell the house. I'm flipping the house and making 35000 or something. And I, the only, there was a part of me that went, damn it, I knew I shouldn't have sold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but That's yeah, funny. Yeah, we liquidated everything uh, as instructed. And Bruce, I mean, it was huge because my goal was $1 million. I wanted 10 houses. They were all going to be worth, you know, I'm buying them in the thirties and forties and whatever. I, I bought a house for 15 grand one time. I, in, in, and, and I'm, I'm going to liquidate. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep them till they're worth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars each. 
and they, they'll be paid off in 10 years, right? And then I'm going to own, and, and I'm going to be getting a thousand dollars rent from each house. That my, and it's going to cost me about 20% because I manage it myself. So I'm going to net $8,000 a month. That's all I wanted. I mean, I didn't want, I, you, you're talking to somebody who came from absolutely nothing financially, right? I mean, my, I, we were born in Cuba. We came here where, I mean, I cleaned floors. I did all kinds of menial work my whole life. I was a high school dropout. It's not like I'm looking to the future to say, oh, I'm some, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be doing this or that. I'm going to get this great paying job. I had to go back to school at night just to learn appraising and, and understand real estate at a more sophisticated level. But most of my stuff was just doing it, you know, just doing it on the street. You know, what's really interesting about the take on. So I sold, oops, what did I do? I don't know. I'm here. Uh, all right. Well, I got to find out what I did wrong to make you disappear. Okay, there we go. That's scary whenever I touch something. So <laughs> if, I t- if I talk to a Tony, Tony Alvarez or even have a discussion with myself, I want to sell everything. I, you know, you talk to Mike Cantu, who wants to keep everything. Right. It, it, didn't, it, it was a different type of inventory. It was part of his very long plan. So you had the plan to keep stuff, but... I think there was round two and round three that you had in your mind that that was playable again. Now I, I want to, uh, you're, you have a very smart business model. When you have the REO market, you make friends and you are friends with the people that control the inventory yes. and you, and they trust you and yes. it's well learned. So that's, that's like on automatic pilot, Tony, we have another one. We have another one. Right. And, now, but when you got rid of them, what did, how did you reward them when you saw Well, them? at the time, as you know, when the market is, is soaring, right, and, and, it's, and it's pandemonium, everyone's, all the buyers are in, it's a seller's market. <clears throat> what's, the, what's the thing that everyone, all the sellers, the typical mom and pop sellers and stuff, they're looking to pay as little commission as they possibly can. Yep. And they, they don't want to pay anything if they could, you know, that's where... Uh, you know, help you sell and all those things came out at the time, right? Oh, sure. we host a house for 1% and all this nonsense. Okay, so my deal was, here's a property I'm paying $30,000 for, right? At the time, right? I'm to 30, 35,000. I'm going to spend five to 10 grand to fix this, this place up. And, I'm, and then I'm going to be selling it. And now it's $300,000. You know, Am I going to worry about what I'm going to pay in commission? No, I wanted to pay a full commission. And that was the deal that I made with the agents. If you bring me a deal, if you bring me a deal and they were, and and, and the people I work with understood because I trained them without really saying that out loud, I I worked with them carefully. And some of them were knowledgeable. Don Anderson, one of my best friend brokers, he didn't need me to teach him anything. If anything, the only thing he learned from me was when we would go to sell, he was always wanting to sell it lower than what I knew I could get for that house. And one day he finally admitted to me, he said, you know, I realized that this is your income and I need to respect your opinion on this stuff because, you know, I'm looking at selling, selling real estate, selling, you know, and I'm looking for the number that's going to bring in the most buyers and stuff into you. Every penny counts. Right. All so, right. so, but that's a, that you develop, how do you develop friendships? You know, you, you develop it by both parties understanding each other. I understood a lot about him. Right. He he valued his family. He valued what he did for work. He valued his knowledge. Right. So I wanted him to know that I respected that. I value that. So I said to him, will you bring me a deal? I can tell you a couple of things. Number one, if Tony gets off his chair (laughs) to go look at a piece of property, he wants to own that piece of property. If it's interesting enough for me to do that, I want to own that. I'm not going to go out there, look around, walk around and say, oh, no, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'm not going to make an offer on this. I'm going to make an offer. And if I make an offer and it gets accepted, I'm owning that thing. Even if I find a dead body buried underneath it, okay, I'm committed. So he knew that he didn't have to worry. If we got to the offer stage and it was accepted, it's a done deal. I'm not going to cancel escrow on him midway or if he's going to find out I don't have the money or, you know. Um, also when I go to sell it, whether it's a month from now or 10 years from now, it's going right back to him. If he's no longer working in the business, he needs to refer me to who he wants to give that commission to. And I'm paying a full 6% or whatever the commission is at the time. That's his call, not mine. And why is because in my mind, he was as much an owner of that inventory as I was. 
he brought it to me because he, he had confidence in me. And, and I understand that because over time, I got to learn what his fears were, right? If I don't do that rehab correctly, right? If I don't take care of things, if I'm just, you know, making it like lipstick on a pig, they call it, right? And I'm not really taking care of, of, uh, of issues. Um, it got to the point, Bruce, and I just had this conversation with someone up here uh, recently. I said, you know, because they said, what is the biggest thing that you ever gave as a guarantee or anything to someone, you know? I said, I remember one time I had a, a person I sold a house to and I got, and it was one of Don's deals, Don Anderson's deal. Don called me. He said, Hey, we got a problem. It was in, the, it was raining like crazy. And it was in the fall in the, in the Yellow Valley. And this guy I had sold a house to who was a veteran, he, he, he got some leaks on his roof and we had done a roof cert and all that kind of stuff. I said, so why are you calling me? He said, well, we tried to call the guy who did the roof cert. He's not responding. I said, Oh, okay. He said, Tony, you got to, you got you to take care of this. I said, don't worry about it, Don. Give me the guy's address. I'll go by and talk to him, see what needs to be done. I'm thinking we're going to repair this roof. And I, and, and, and I go to this guy's house. When I knock on the door, it's pouring cats and dogs, okay? And in the Antelope Valley, when it rains, brother, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a flood. She opens the door. The wife opens the door. She's laughing hysterically. And she goes, excuse me, I can't, I, I, can we help you? And I said, well, I'm here to, my, I sold you this house. And I look. Her husband's in the back. I can see him running around with pots and pans. Oh, putting it. no. It's not a leak. It was like <laughs> Swiss cheese, you know, oh. leak water coming in. I felt so embarrassed. You know, the end result is we end up putting him up and they're laughing about it. They weren't, they're not looking to kill me, right? They, 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 they couldn't believe it. We put them up in a hotel. We paid for everything. I re-roofed his house. For years after that, that man would come to our office and bring his friends and say, that's the guy. <laughs> we, six months after, because we told him the house in the summertime, and this happened in the fall, winter. He said, he repaired my roof when he didn't have to do that. He could have just said, hey, we got a roof, sir, and blah, 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 blah. If I'd have known, and I told the story before, if I'd have known I was going to get so many referrals from people as a result of doing the roofs, I would have done more of them. Even if I'd, I would have been drilling those holes myself just to have to repair the roof. But well, I don't want people to miss one of the more important things is Don Anderson was around in the next phase yes. of downturn. Yes. So what you did had another life. Oh, absolutely. Com completely. So it wasn't necessarily why you did it, but that agent learned a lot about you when you did the first four or five dozen houses. Right. And now... When he starts touching 500 of those houses, right. Tony Alvarez deserves the first call. And, 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 and I want you to know that it, it's very true. I, I love gardening stuff and stuff like that. And, you know, in, 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 in plants, they have things that are annuals or, or perennials, right? Uh, some of those, and I can never remember which is which, but one of them dies out and that's it. You got to go buy a new one and plant it. And another one looks like it's dead, right? And then when the springtime comes, it blooms again. It comes out and it's a whole other plant. And over time, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Yep. yep. My relationships with those brokers and those agents was exactly the same. It didn't die out when the market changed. If anything, and I stayed in touch with a lot of folks. Some people left. Some people moved on. They changed their jobs or whatever. But those relationships flourished over time. And, and they were, it paid off in the next market. I told you in the, in the, in the downturn, we experienced that hit in the Antelope Valley in 2006. And so we kept our office open. We, we kept looking for stuff. Um, but really the market was declining and it was like, well, where do you, when's this going to stop? You know? Yeah. And then we, we jumped back in as really active buyers in, two, in 2008. And I went straight back to those same brokers and agents and, and it was a love relationship where i'm walking in i'm getting hugged <laughs> hallelujah we thought you left i said no because that the worst thing i told don one time i said you know i'm thinking about retiring what are you talking about <laughs> I, said, I said i'm thinking about i'm thinking about hanging it up you know i've done oh well i've done well you know it was an excess of at the time it was an excess of 10 million dollars i mean come on you know for the kid from cuba who came over here i was a million dollars to me was a huge amount of money uh, and something to look forward to. And here, I mean, it was, it's been, it, it was the greatest ride ever. And 
I didn't crash and burn any of those relationships. I didn't end. And it was, I mean, in 2008, we got right back in the marketplace, started buying again, and rolled that market up again. Did it again. I even bought some of the same exact houses that I had <laughs> bought in the 30s. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm, this is uh, no. And they can go look. People can look this stuff up. Evergreen properties. I bought houses for 30s, sold them for 300000 then bought them again for forty thousand dollars, and it and it, and it was it was. I mean, Sabrina used to laugh at me. She 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 she. It can't be this easy. And I say, well, you know what? It just seems easy, because we're so familiar with the area. We're so connected with the same brokers. It 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 seems like it's easy. It makes it seem like it's it's a no brainer. I said, but believe me, that took years of hard work and dedication and making, <clears throat> really making a commitment to myself that I would conduct myself in a certain way. But and, realize, realize the two disciplines that made that possible. You had to have the willingness to sell when everything was crazy. And you did have that thought, it could get crazier and I could make more. But you right. disciplined yourself. But you also had the discipline to buy this stuff again when a lot of people, I, even the 300 grand house now that's 45, there wasn't a lot of crowd going after that yet because there was so much fear in the market. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And let me just clear one thing up. My first purchase in the Antelope Valley was for $68,000. These were houses I had bought in the thirties. Keep in mind, the market was going down still. It was still declining. Yeah. And I remember that conversation with Sabrina because Sabrina, my assistant of many years was nervous. She had already learned how to buy and stuff. I had to kind of force her uh, to get into it. And, uh, and I had said to her, this time around, you're going to pull the trigger on a lot of these deals. Oh, I can't do this. I don't, you're crazy. I can't do what you do. I said, okay, yeah, we'll figure it. We'll, we'll, we'll see how poorly you do. She did fabulous. And the first house I paid 68 grand, she told me I was nuts. She said, what, what are you buying that house? And that house, by, by the way, ended up being a legal nonconforming. It was, it, it was a single family on a lot that the city had changed the zoning in the, in the middle of between 2006 and 2008. They had rezoned it to commercial. I couldn't even get a loan on that house from, from a bank. I didn't even know that at the time. I wanted to know I bought that house all cash, right? So, and in that moment in time, you couldn't get financing. Nobody would touch you. I, my credit was excellent. I had literally millions of dollars in the bank. I remember I went, you were borrowing, you were borrowing from us because you couldn't get a, crime, a line of credit from the bank. I got, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I remember going into a, at the, at the time it was a Mission Bank, and no, Mojave Bank. Uh, George uh, Nate, uh, Nagy, who had been a, a really good good friend uh, for many years, and I went. I said, George, I, I gotta I gotta set this up. I gotta I need some money. I'm buying like crazy. We can't touch it, Tony. You're an investor. That's a swear word around here. He said, We can't we can't do anything. I said, Are you joking? I remember because you well you had sort of sold all your rental properties, which was income, and turned it into this gigantic pile of cash. So this right. first comment was, Well, you don't have any income. So I recall you buying, the only reason I remember this is because we were involved in the loan stuff. So you bought 30 houses and created yourself $30,000 a month income, went back to him, and he said it has to be on two years of tax returns. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah. uh, there'll, yeah. there'll always be a place for private money. That's what I thought. Yeah, no, you know, and, and, it, and it was funny, but that was like a one step at a time. I'd go, I, I'd go back there, reject me for one reason. I'd go back there, reject me for another reason. But i tell you what I did, okay? Here's, I said, I would say to him, and they had a little coffee machine in the front. They would put coffee and sometimes they'd have like a muffin or something, you know, and I would always go in, grab a cup. It was like a Keurig machine, you know, <laughs> grab a cup of coffee and get myself a muffin or something and go in and say, Hey, I want to see George. Well, weren't you here last week? Tony? Yeah, I'm here to see him again. And he, and he'd see me and he'd start shaking his head. He's, he's, a, <laughs> he's a lovely, lovely guy. Right. He'd say, didn't I tell you we're not doing those loans? I said, yeah, I know. And I'm going to be here next week again. <laughs> he said, why are you putting yourself through this? I said, because, George, there's going to come a moment when you are going to be doing those loans, and I'm going to be the guy first in line for that deal. And he laughed. Okay. So, I don't know, six months, a year, whatever the heck it was, goes by. My cell phone rings. I look down, and it's George and Nate. I open it up. I say, yes. He goes, <laughs> Tony, I need you to come by and see me today. I said, did things change? He goes, let's talk in person. I said, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on to do a tremendous amount of deals for me. And then, and then they got bought out by Mission Bank. And, 
and, and Mission Bank and my relationship with them was so wonderful that uh, up here in the Oregon where I, I'm doing business now, uh, when I first came up here, I had a I had a bit of a head bucking session with one of the lenders here. It was it was just a mistake that they that they made, and um, I was complaining about it. That's kind of, that's the kind of relationship I have with the guys down at down at Mission Bank. I was I was talking to them and I said I can't believe they put me through this. And you know what their response was? You know we're gonna have a we're gonna have a meeting and see if we don't open a branch up there and handle your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now that's that's. You can't get any better. Of course, I said, no, I, that's not, you know, I mean, are you pulling my leg? He said, no, we're thinking about expanding. And he said, it would be great if, you know, you, we're doing all your deals to start with. And, and you know, we'll, we'll connect up there. And I said, no, I don't want that responsibility. God forbid, you know, but, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a great, great experience. And, and, um, and it's basically using those, those same kind of, those same kind of moves where, yes, I'm motivated by a little dream it seems little now right when i look back but it was huge to me then and um it was really more about um analyzing my own behavior my own my own how i conduct myself you know my own actions and making sure that when i deal with other people that i care about the level of their success i've always said as much as my own and, and uh, I was able to embody that in my decisions. I was really able to bring that to life. And I did not want to be involved in any other type of decision making. I refused to do it. Just like I would always tell people that I find cooperation um, in, in business affairs a lot better than, than a competitive mindset. In competition, I have nothing against competition. It, it, it's, a, it's a real mindset and it's part of what we do. But I want to get from competition to cooperation as fast as I can. You know, and I would always, if I found myself in a difficult situation where there's another business person and me, or we're fighting for the same thing or whatever, whatever, you know, I would say, why don't we just partner up, bro? And I'm not a big partner guy. I want you to know I'm, I'm a lone writer, you know, and like do my own thing because I want to be able to have the freedom to make those decisions without having to look at somebody else and, and, and then worry about, do they see things the same way? Do we have right. the same principles, really? So. But I would rather do that than, you know, call up, uh, you know, call the attorney and start fucking heads over this or that. I'm not, that's not my word. No. So, no. It's been I, paid off. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.